Reach through the ages and now speak to me. You're my creator, King. My creation. 
Well, a very good morning to you all, and welcome back to another Oldfield Park Baptist Church online service. However you found us, whether you found us through social media or whether you found us through YouTube's magical algorithm, you are very, very welcome here this morning, wherever you are and whoever you are. My name is Paul. I'm the community outreach worker here at Oldfield Park Baptist Church, so allow me to extend a very warm welcome to you this morning. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm starting to really feel more and more excited about the prospect of meeting together in person, albeit in a very socially distant sort of way. But I'm really looking forward to things getting up back to a little bit more normality. And one of the things I'm most excited about is um, meeting together and being able to see all of your warm and friendly faces, either at the front of church uh, or at the back of church uh, over a cup of coffee. Uh, one thing that I'm not looking forward to as much is the prospect of having to attend church in something other than my pyjamas. But there we go. Uh, during the service this morning, we're going to be joining together in song. Uh, we'll be praying together and we'll be looking at a little bit more of the letter that Peter wrote in 1 Peter, uh, looking at just a couple of verses from chapter 4. Uh, on the subject of services, uh, if you missed last week's service, um, it, it was Easter. We had two uh, services, the Sunday Easter Sunday service, and also a special Maundy, Maundy Thursday service. Uh, they're both still on the website and the YouTube channel. Please feel free to check them out and catch up with those. They're really worthwhile uh, if you miss those. So just before we start, let's open our time together in prayer and commit this time to God. So join me in prayer. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us. We thank you for this new day and this opportunity to sing to you and to praise you with song. Lord, we thank you so much uh, for everything that you have given us and everything, uh, every way that you continue to sustain us. And Lord, we thank you so much that you've blessed us with this technology that allows us to continue to do church together in some way even as we've been forced apart throughout this last long year. And we thank you too that the time seems to be coming where this lockdown will come to an end. So Lord, we pray that everything would go smoothly, that, lockdown, that the lockdown would start to be eased, and that we would be able to start meeting together with one another as planned in your church building. Father, as we worship you this morning, I pray that our hearts will be filled with joy and thankfulness, that we would lift up our hearts to you and pray that whatever busyness or stresses we've had in the week would just fade away as we think about who you are and all that you've done for us. And so we commit our time to you here in prayer as we open up, uh, our, 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 as we open up your word uh, and as we come together. Lord, bless us this morning as we seek to know you better. We ask this in Jesus' name. Well, we are going to sing uh, together, we're going to join together in song, and we're going to start by singing two songs. The first is Yet Not I, and then uh, the second is Give to Our God Immortal Praise. So let's join together and sing.
Yes, I hold my shepherd will defend me through the deepest valley.
Let us pray. Father God, as we approach you now through the blood of your Son, the Lord Jesus, we confess that the days we are living through are challenging to our faith, and without your promises of a glorious future, we would struggle. We pray for the continuing need that we face with the, com with the COVID virus. We ask that at a national level, you guide and direct the various agencies that are critical to delivering us from the virus. We pray especially for doctors, nurses, pharmacists, ambulance services, as we ask that you sustain them through the daily demands on their lives. We pray for a consensus on the distribution of the vaccines. We pray particularly for the poorer countries, that they get a fair share of the resources even though they don't have the cash to do it. We pray for the people of our country to be responsible and sensible as we transition out of lockdown. We pray that those who are fit and able will be patient with those who are more vulnerable and not pressurise agencies and the government to meet their personal expectations. Father, as we look ahead, we pray for wisdom for our church leaders and for Mark in particular as we begin to have our services back at church again. Help us, Lord God, to get it right. We pray for those in our church who are facing health issues unrelated to COVID-19, for those receiving treatment, those awaiting test results, those recovering after surgery, and for those who experience significant levels of anxiety. Lord God, we look to you and pray at this time that you move in our nation. Renew us, Father. Stir our hearts afresh to serve you and to bring honour to your name. We ask it in the name of the Lord Jesus. the one at the beginning, one with God the Lord most high, your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ, what a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name as you
Many of us will feel nervous about the end of lockdown and we'll be worrying that we're moving too quickly to open our doors. But for others, um, we might think that we're dragging our feet and just not doing enough sooner. So the problem I see is this. How are we going to be a community again when we've been so out of practice of it for so long? Well, as we listen to Peter's words here today, my hope is that we'll be able to gain some proper perspectives about the end, about each other, and about purpose that will really speak in to the problem of um, how we come out of lockdown, how we meet as a community together. So that's my goal. Let's dive into this passage. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 7 says, The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. So first, we need to get a good perspective about time. You know, sometimes it's a good idea to just step back and get a big picture view, a big picture perspective on what's going on. Now if I were to put up this image and, uh, and ask you what's happening in this picture, you'd be right in saying that it's a picture of just a lot of coloured blobs and you couldn't really say anything of what was going on. But zoom out a bit, you might be able to see something else. So maybe, maybe you're able to see a man with a moustache. Um, maybe you're able to see that he's looking to the left, but really there's no way of, of saying exactly what the context is. You probably can't tell what the man's doing. But zoom out even further, though, and you'll see how this figure is just one of a group of figures in this painting. Suddenly there's a context to the image. We can see so much more of what's going on. We can understand what's going on in the picture better, but also what the, uh, what the painter wants to show us. You know, sometimes... We can just be too close to our situation to make any sense of what the big picture is. By taking a step back, we can see more clearly about what's going on. Now in verse 7, Peter's trying to get his hearers to take a step back from all the troubles they face, and he wants them to, to take in the bigger picture. And he does so by urging those early Christians to remember that the end of all things is near. It's the idea that he really needs them to grasp as he's finishing off his letter. And it's an important idea for us to hold on to as we begin to come out of lockdown and start meeting together again. But why is it so important? Well, knowing that the end of something is near is helpful for us to put it into an appropriate perspective in a number of ways. So firstly, knowing there's an end coming can help you endure suffering. If you're going through a time of suffering, whatever that might be, really easy to lose hope. Um, many of you will remember that my wife, Katie, um, suffered from gallstones about, uh, about a year ago. Now it started just with slight abdominal pains, but it rapidly grew worse and worse over just several months, to the point where eating meals just became a miserable experience. And it took the doctors, unfortunately, a long time to diagnose it. And it meant that we were held in this strange limbo of just not knowing what the problem was or when and if it could be fixed. And it just, it all felt so hopeless. It wasn't until after a surgeon finally gave us a date for an operation to sort everything out that the way we went about talking about the, pain, the pains changed. Um, all of a sudden there was hope and optimism mixed in amongst the struggle just from knowing that there was a possibility it was coming to an end. We could continue to keep going and not despair because we knew on this date it would be coming to an end. Despite the suffering, relief was coming. And knowing that the pain would end allowed us to put it in perspective and to be a bit braver in how we approached our lives, uh, about how we approached the pain and how we approached our own plans. Well, for these early Christians, hearing the words of verse 7 from Peter was supposed to bring out this sort of hope. Because they were really up against it. They were being persecuted and cut out of their communities because of their faith in Jesus. They were suffering for their beliefs. So Peter's words here were written to give comfort and strength to keep going just a little longer. Relief is coming because of 
the hope of the resurrection, they could know that Jesus would be returning to make everything right. And that end was near. Secondly, knowing there's an end coming can help us to keep going through hardship. Now, I'm told that the hardest part of a marathon is the final few miles. For me, that's not true. The hardest part of a marathon is finding the bother to run a marathon. But after about 20 miles, I'm told, of constant running, your body's at a point of exhaustion. But with a further six miles to go, the challenge becomes less about your physical stamina and more about your mental strength. Do you have what it takes to mentally convince your body to keep moving towards the finish? Now, I'm told that one key to finishing, uh, to finishing the race after hitting the wall is to break down what's left of the run into small, achievable chunks and to have a good idea of how much longer you have left to go. And this can give you the incentive to carry on, to push on, when your entire body's crying out for you to stop. Knowing there's an end in sight helps to focus our efforts getting to the goal. And I think this is the sort of comfort that Peter wants to give the Christians that he's addressing. Because bearing in mind, in chapter 3, Peter's made some incredible calls to his believers to, quote, live such good lives among the pagans, that even though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. See, this was going to be hard work. It was going to involve resisting what the dominant culture was telling them was morally acceptable. It would involve going against their own desires to rebel against authorities that are mistreating them. It was going to go against their own sinful temptation to use underhand tactics to get by. So by reminding them that the end was near, Peter was actually empowering them with a goal to set their eyes on, a target to aim for, to press on when the going got tough. Thirdly, knowing there's an end coming can help us to prioritise more accurately. There's a quote that I love that sums this point up. It goes, nobody on their deathbed has ever said, oh, I wish I'd spent more time at the office. Because in the face of death, what most of us consider to be pretty clear, a pretty clear end to most things, when people look back on their lives, they often have a clear idea of what they've seen as important and what they wish they'd done differently. But with the end, as a final marker, it can allow us to assess what we actually deem to be important, what we want our lives and our work to be remembered for. So for Peter's hearers, knowing that there was an end and that it was near would help them to see how foolish it would be to put their hopes in the things of the here and now. He'd spent the biggest part of the opening of his letter singing the praises of this living hope that Christians have in the risen Jesus, an inheritance that will never spoil or fade, an inheritance kept in heaven for them. The idea that the greatest enjoyment is still to come. It's not found here in this world, it's found with Jesus, and it dwarfs everything else by comparison. So if, that, if that's true, then putting our hope or dedicating our lives to pursuing anything else would just be pointless. So with all that in mind, knowing that the end of all things is near that can help us to endure suffering, keep persevering through difficulties and to prioritise. What should we do with that? How should that affect how we respond? Well, looking at the second half of verse 7, Peter says, Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Now it's clear that the intention of Peter's reminder was to encourage a realistic and sober-minded assessment of their situation and to commit everything to God in prayer. And this makes so much sense. You know, when we suffer, it's really easy to feel desperate and ignored by God. Those are the most important times for us to be crying out to our loving Father. When we face difficulties, well, we should entrust ourselves to our powerful Creator who can do anything He wills. When we are making plans, we shouldn't be focused only on the here and now, but thinking ahead to the what is to come. While everything else is temporary and it's coming to an end, God is eternal, and therefore whatever ways we can use the here and now, whatever ways we can use the difficulties here to build our trust in and our closeness to God, well that will have lasting value, that will last forever, even when things do come to an end. It is the only thing of real, lasting value. So then how does this fit in to the problem that we highlighted at the start? Well we can acknowledge and know that however hard it might be, 
this struggle too will come to an end. Whatever difficulties we face as we start to ease out of lockdown, we can and should be always looking for ways to rely on God through prayer. So let me encourage you to be constantly holding up Alfred Park Baptist Church in your personal prayers. Pray for wisdom for Mark as he leads us. Pray for him as he prepares uh, sermons week after week. Pray for the deacons, that they would make decisions and plans for the future wisely. Pray for the members of the church, for unity in decision making. Pray for unity just amongst all of us believers as we begin to come back together. Pray for the outreach into the community around us, because the, the community is filled with people feeling the same nerves as us, but without the assurance and hope that we have in Jesus. And you know, let's pray that through this long year of separation, this testing time of coming back together, that our faith would be found stronger, our love for the Lord Jesus that would be found deeper, and our hope of eternity with him even more joyous. So that's Peter's first perspective, that the end of all things has come near. So then, his second perspective. We need to have the right attitude towards others. So whilst we're still waiting for the end of all things, you know, we can't just bury our heads in the sand. We have to still engage with the here and now. And the world is a broken place. And so we need wisdom in knowing how to navigate our way through life. It was a little bit, it's a little bit like, um, like Katie's surgeon. So as well as, as giving us a date for her operation, he also prescribed her some pretty strong painkillers and gave her exercises and a, a strict diet to minimise and manage the pains that, um, while she waited for the operation date. And in a similar way, God has given us a way to live as a community of broken people whilst we wait for Jesus' return. But God isn't so worried about changing the people around us as he is about changing our hearts to be more Christ-like in how we relate to them. So in this next part of our passage, Peter gives us three examples of how we should engage with others in light of the difficulties that we'll face when doing so. Thankfully, he doesn't say anything cryptic. Uh, we need to love, we need to be hospitable, and we need to serve others. So firstly, we need to love each other deeply. I'd say this is probably the hardest, um, probably the hardest thing that God asks us to do in this passage, and, and possibly the entire letter, because God is calling us to love each other deeply. We aren't to pretend it, to act as though we're friends with people who turn up at the doors. No, we're actually to act, we are to actually actively love one another. And this is going to involve sharing our lives with others, being honest about where we are um, and how we're struggling, what our doubts are. It's going to be about listening to our brothers and sisters in the faith as they go through hardships, offering our support, praying for people. And all of this, not just for the easy folk who kind of keep to themselves and don't say anything, but no, but for the people who we consider to be actually really difficult and needy. This is a hard calling because, as every single Christian knows, we are broken, sinful creatures. Sure, we have some beautiful things about us and sometimes we scrub up better than others. But at our core, each and every one of us has a deep heart problem. We are sinners. We live as though we are the centre of reality. And many people are only looking out for themselves. We don't want to be taken as a fool. So it means that we have to deal with broken people. And they have to deal with our brokenness. Let's be honest, it's going to take some hard work for us all to love each other deeply. And it's going to take a lot of courage to reach out to others and offer help to those around us. But if we do this, as Peter says, love covers over a multitude of sins. Simply put, if we love each other deeply, we will strive to look uh, to overlook the times when we're hurt, when others wrong us. We'll instead look for the good in people, and we'll see them charitably. And there will be times when our loving others will be the draw that changes people's hearts away from their sin and towards the love of their maker. We will be modelling the gospel when we do this, because we have all experienced that same love that covers over a multitude of sins in our own lives. Because in his mercy and grace, God has loved us. He loves me. He loves you. He bears with our failings and our evil tendencies. He sees them all and he loves us still in Christ. He gives us everything we need. And many times he gives us not just the things we need, but so much more. And he patiently bears with our flaws and faults.
unfolds time and time and time again. When we find it hard to love one another, we should be confident to call out to him in prayer, knowing that he gets it, he understands, and he will provide the Holy Spirit to soften our hearts towards our brothers and sisters in Christ. Because when we love each other in this way, we're modelling Christ's love to the world. So guys, above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Second, we need to be hospitable. Verse 9 says, Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Now that seems very self-explanatory. All of us should be inviting each other over for tea and biscuits. I have my phone here. I will wait the phone calls and text messages to come just flying in. No, I, I think Peter means something slightly more than just tea and biscuits when he says, be hospitable. See, what he actually means is that we need to have a heart that's welcoming a constant desire to be looking to include the outsider. We should be looking to warmly invite others to share our lives. Sure, that might mean sometimes inviting people in for tea and biscuits. That's great. But it might also be looking out for those who are on the fringes or um, watching for those people who are a bit shy on Sunday and just gently going over to say a gentle hello. Or it might be you know, boldly and confidently inviting a neighbour to come and join us on a Sunday morning. It might be inviting somebody over for a meal. It could be calling on someone you know is isolated. Uh, I don't know. But what I do know is it will definitely involve welcoming people into your life who are different to you. Because, you know, the temptation is uh, to offer hospitality to those who are just like us, who we naturally get on with. But instead, we're to offer hospitality to everyone without grumbling. And that's the kicker, really. Uh, is we've got to do this all without grumbling. It's not going to be our natural desire. But when we have that perspective that the end of all things is near, so that we can press on towards it with hope, calling out to God when it gets difficult. And again, when we do this, we are modelling God's love to the world because, you know, he welcomes anyone into his kingdom. The only criteria for entry into the love of God is whether we acknowledge Jesus as our saviour and king and trust in his death and resurrection to save us from our sins. That's it. That's the only criteria. And you know, when we accept that, far from grumbling about who we are, God rejoices. God rejoices at every single person who comes to him in faith. Jesus himself says that there is great rejoicing in heaven at every sinner who repents. So, in the same way, we should offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Thirdly, we need to serve others. Verse 10 says, Each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. See, as we go about loving each other and offering our hospitality to those around us, we're going to be led to a point of, of serving those around us. As God welcomes us into his family, into this community of faith, we should recognise that he's given us a variety of ways that we can look out for one another and serve one another. There are some things that we're going to be naturally good at that we can be used to be a blessing to those around us. Peter calls us here to use whatever gifts we have in a way that recognises that it's God who's provided them to us, not for our benefit or for our ego, but for the building up of his community, the community of believers. We need to have the perspective that our gifts are for the benefit of others. They're not to be used for our own glory and fame. No, it's God who's given them to us for the building and strengthen, strengthening of his people. Now you might be thinking, well, Paul, I, I don't have a particular set of skills. You know, I can't teach. I'm not confident. Uh, I'm not a good speaker. You know, I don't feel comfortable meeting new people. Well, let me put your doubts to rest. Whatever doubts you have, just know that your value isn't based upon what you can offer the church. Your value is based entirely on the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that makes you so precious and invaluable, and that will never change. And it also means that however little you think you have to offer, in actuality, you are God's blessing to the church, and God is working in the church through you with all that you are. So what a great living example of what the gospel is, because you and I know that we have a God who serves us time and time again, and he chooses 
to serve us through through us. Indeed, he cho chooses to serve us by, for, by, he chooses to serve through us by providing for the needs of others through us. So, in light of Peter's words, how should this affect us in light of our problem when we think about meeting together again? How should Peter's words here uh, affect how we respond? Well. Things are going to be a bit jarring as we start to meet again. Uh, I'd expect everything's going to feel a bit uncomfortable, a bit unusual in terms of how we meet together and with all the social distancing in place. But we should have the perspective that we're meeting for the good of those around us more than for our own benefit. We should love one another, bearing with each other's failings. We should be hospitable to one another and we should serve each other with whatever gifts we have. In everything, let's look to the needs of those around us. So that's Peter's second perspective. We ought to have the right attitude towards others. So we move on to Peter's third perspective. We need to understand our purpose. I don't know if you've seen The Lion King recently, but there's a brilliant scene where Simba calls out to his father and, and the fusser, his face appears in the clouds and he cries out to his son, Simba, remember who you are. Or in a similar way, we need to remember who we are. We are God's representatives. That's the point, that, a big point that Peter has been making throughout his letter, is that we represent God in this world. And so we need to have a perspective that everything we have comes from God. And we have to remember that we represent God in this world, um, but that everything we have comes from him. Uh, we are sustained by him, and it's to be used for his praise and for his honour. If you look with me at verse 11, First Peter says, you know, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. Now, this, this doesn't just refer to people who handle teaching or preaching. Actually, the word that is translated here as, as speaking um, has a much broader meaning. In fact, in classical Greek, the same words used to mean just chatting. Um, basically, Peter's saying, if, you're, if you talk, if you talk to people, you should do so. As one who speaks the very words of God, you're representing God. Whoever we are, if we're talking to other people, we need to have the presence of mind to think that we are representing God to the world around us. It's a bit like an ambassador for a foreign country. Every word that is said represents the nation that they've come from. In the same way, we are like God's ambassadors. And um, so we represent God in the words that we use with others. So we have to be careful. For some of us, this might mean that we need to watch our language. That just means swearing, although, yeah, we should not do that. But I mean, we need to be respectful in how we talk to, uh, talk to others and respectful about how we talk about others. For some, this, is, uh, this might also mean that we need to um, think twice about how um, we go about being truthful, because we're all going to be tempted to bend or break the truth. Um, for others of us, it means that when we speak, we need to speak the gospel plainly and clearly to those who need to hear it. Or maybe we need to rebuke those who do wrong. Or maybe we need to build up those who are hurting with words of comfort. In whatever ways we speak, we need to do so with the perspective um, that we are representing God in our words. But then Peter goes on to say, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. Again. You know, this is going to apply to all of us, because if you remember Peter's verse just a moment ago, Peter's just told us that we should all be serving one another with the gifts that God's given. So all of us, when we serve, we need to remember that we don't do this from some well of energy that's innate in us. All of us, when we serve, in whatever way that is, we should realise that we're only able to do so by God himself. Without God providing the strength for us, we would be utterly incapable of anything. However, if we realise that God provides the strength to serve, well, that will enable us to lean on him and to rely on him when things become hard and we're tempted to stop or we're tempted to be demotivated. And that will help us to continue to serve. And finally, Peter says these final words of our passage, in all things... God may be praised uh, through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. So, see, as we begin to understand that we represent God to the world around us, and as we begin 
to rely on him to provide the strength we need to serve his church, well then we'll begin to understand that ultimately it's not for our own fame and glory, but it's instead for his glory and praise. Now all of this is really going to help as we think about this challenge of meeting back together, of coming out of lockdown, because if we get our perspective on our purpose right, well that that, you know, we should be representing God to the world around us in the strength that he provides in order that he will get the glory and praise for it all. Well, then we'll see that whatever we do and whatever plans we make to begin meeting again, we can know that it, it doesn't matter if things go well or if things go badly. As we represent God to those around us, if there are struggles at any point, we can rely on him and call out to him. And if things go well, we'll well, we know that all of the praise and glory will go to him and we can lift up our hearts in joyous praise to him. So, what shall we say to conclude? I think let's all strive and aim to meet together again as a community. You know, the time is short because the end is near and let's be honest, we need each other. It's not always going to be easy. And there will always be people, people like me running around making what would otherwise be a lovely church experience a little bit rotten. But it is important that we keep meeting together. Maybe you're tempted to give church a miss. You know, it's, it's more convenient to stay at home watching church in your pyjamas at, at our leisure. You know, it is. However, how, let me challenge you and say, how is that serving others? Maybe you need to hear that you need to come and serve people. Or maybe you're staying away from church out of fear and, you know, it's a scary time. Let me encourage you. Maybe not meeting on a Sunday, but how can you connect with the people of God in the community to help you um, get through these fears and to lean and rely on God in prayer? You know, guys, whatever it is we're feeling, however we're feeling about lockdown, we need these three perspectives to understand our situation, to know how to live accordingly. We need the perspective that the end is coming near. We don't have all the time in the world to, to sit on our hands, but also this struggle will pass too. And so whatever happens, we'll only have to bear with it for a short time. We need the perspective of our attitude towards others. We need to bear with others um, and we need to serve them humbly with the gifts that God has given us. And lastly, we need a perspective on our purpose and, and who we're actually doing all this for and who deserves the credit. Everything we have comes from God. We represent God to everyone around us. And so God, he deserves all of the praise that can be gathered from what we do. And so uh, let's be alert and with sober minds, let's commit all of this to God in prayer. Let's pray. We lift this church to you and ask that you'd watch over us and care for us and provide all that we need. Thank you for sending your son Jesus to die for us, to rise again. And we thank you that in that hope we come together as a community of your chosen people. Father, please help us when things get tough. We ask that you'd watch over us as we start to meet together again. And we ask that you'd help us to be united as a people loving one another deeply and truly. Help us uh, to love one another, we ask. And we ask that um, the words in this letter would really speak to our hearts and change us uh, so that um, you would help us to have a right perspective. You would help us to see things as they really are, to see ourselves as we really are, loved so deeply by you. We pray that you would help us to live lives that bring you glory and praise, which is entirely deserving, and, and you are so worthy of all glory and praise. And so we ask, Father, that you would be with us this coming week as we commit our time to you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Praise to him, the God of might, who 
from the mountains by his might. All oh, praise to him who named the stars that sing his famous skies afar. All oh, praise to him who reigns in love, who guides the galaxies above, yet bends to hear our every prayer with sovereign power and tender Oh, no. 